Are we live? Are we live? Thank you, Anthony. Okay, everybody. I'm going to call us to order. This is uh, the last but not least presentation of the day, and I'm so excited um, to introduce you to this amazing panel that we have here uh, for you, representing um, three uh, incredible institutions in, in the area of competency-based education and online learning. Um, these are um, folks that you um, uh, should follow on Twitter, should uh, maybe even already know, because Ginger comes from uh, our family, uh, but I am just just very, very pleased to introduce to you Ginger Bedell, who's the manager um, of a development team in the Business College at Western Governors University. Um, Dr. Callie Morrison, who's the Associate Dean of Alternative Learning at American Public University System, and uh, James Walker Myers, who serves as the uh, Associate Vice President of Learning Science and Assessment for Southern New Hampshire University. Um, very warm welcome to the three of you. Thank you so much for taking us out of this um, of this event. Thank you very much. I think they're on. So I'm Callie Morrison. Just a little context on what American Public University System is. We are an online university system. We have two institutions roughly 80,000 students. Now a very small percentage of those are CBE students, um, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. But CBE is near and dear to my heart because it was also what I did my dissertation on. So um, I have been steeped in it for a good number of years now. And I'm lucky to work with these guys on this presentation. So I'm Ginger Bedell, and I work for Western Governors University, which is based in Salt Lake City, but it's fully online. Um, yeah, so we have about 170,000 students, or 120,000 students currently, 170,000 graduates, and um, I don't know, a pretty big workforce, which is half remote, um, partially based in Salt Lake City, Austin, and Phoenix. And hi, uh, James Walker Myers, uh, Southern New Hampshire University. I've been with um, SNHU um, about seven years. Um, prior to that, had a, a little bit of time at Western Governors University as well, so we've got some um, uh, cross-pollinating of ideas across those institutions. Um, uh, SNHU, um, as you may or may not know, in includes a, a number of different modalities. Uh, so we do have an on-the-ground campus, um, ranging about 3,000 students, uh, mainly focused on um, really kind of uh, intensive um, uh, location-based learning. Um, and then we also have um, our online um, experiences, which comprise the vast majority of our learners. About 120,000 um, students are based in course-based uh, learning at our institution. And our CBE programs, will, which we'll go into more detail, are a subset of our online uh, delivery um, that's really focused on very specific learners coming in through specific channels. Um, so we'll, we'll go into a little bit more details around those models. Okay. And thank you for having us. So next up we have a little poll. We want to know what your opinion of CBE is. Are you intrigued? Are you skeptical? Are you ready to jump in? Or are you already running? And I'll try and do the results here. We'll give just a minute for this. Oh. What's the poll number? Sorry. I realized that if I clicked away from it, you couldn't see it anymore. I didn't set a timer. Why is it not showing? Why is it not? Oh, there we go. Live results. Da. Da. Total results. Why is it show? I see him going up, but I have apparently done something wrong with the poll everywhere. Yeah, it's showing me that I have results. In. Okay. No. Don't want to know about business plans for poll everywhere. <laughs> Maybe that's why. 
Yeah, right? There we go. Hey, hey, figured it out. All right. So lots of people are intrigued. Just a few are ready to uh, already running, and a few more are ready to jump in with a very small skeptical, and that makes me happy, right? Because there used to be, just five years ago, this scale would have looked very different. Even though CBE's been around for 40 years or more, um, there are a lot of people who are still skeptical of that pedagogical model. So I'm going to switch us back to the presentation real quick. Do you want to get started? Absolutely. So I wanted to just share the definition from CBEN of competency-based learning. There are, it's a pretty complicated definition, long definition, I think. Um, but some of the key parts of it are that the, the time that it takes to demonstrate competency varies. So that the I don't know, the, the key thing, or a couple of the key things that make it different is that instead of having, you know, 15-week semesters, um, the time varies, but the competent, but the measurement is the thing that doesn't vary. So um, other, other key characteristics, the programs and courses have clearly defined outcomes. Students receive support from faculty throughout their program and coursework. And also students demonstrate mastery through multiple forms of assessment, depending on the course, the competencies. Yeah, one of the um, key messages I think that we wanted to get out is um, the range of competency-based education um, uh, programs, options, um, how you can set up um, CBE um, is all pretty extensive. Um, and it is very confusing. Um, as we get into the emerging regulations, um, the ways in which financial aid can be used um, for competency-based education, um, a lot of that, in, at least in our history of developing these programs, that has been um, uh, some of the primary areas where we faced roadblocks, where we faced the need to reach out into communities, um, the need to get clarity. Um, often even um, um, our creditors are coming up to speed uh, with regard to competency-based education as well as federal government um, and, and Department of Education understanding more and more about how they can support um, programs. So um, we, we wanted to kind of clarify a little bit about um, what really happens when CBE programs are going into direct assessment and what that means for us. This is really the, uh, the specific definition of what direct assessment means. Um, I'm going to go into another slide of kind of putting this into plain language. Um, but essentially what we're talking about is the measurement, direct measurement of learning um, that provides students credit, and that credit then being a replacement for any kind of aspects of seat time. So it doesn't matter how long a student takes uh, to accomplish a specific measurement. Really what it means is that they will get credit for that um, uh, if they accomplish the quality of measurement and um, assessment uh, that's expected of the institution. So if we go to the next slide, we'll kind of put this more in plain language. So learners gain, gain, gain credit through a direct measure of their learning. That can be a wide range of different assessments. Um, we often use project-based assessments in some of these programs. But that can be also objective exams. Um, it can be demonstration of learning through um, um, a specific uh, portfolio demonstration or um, direct kind of observation um, of students. This is the only required activity for credit in a direct assessment model, meaning that students can skip around in other content that could be optional. Um, they can move through that environment in a lot of creative and flexible ways. Um, but they are not necessarily required in terms of gaining points, in terms of getting um, aspects of a grade. They're not required to do any other activity other than the direct assessment of their, their competency. Um, and again, you'll see a little bit more of this as we talk about our models because we play around with requirements and, and, and how we really um, establish the grading procedures for these programs in different ways through our institutions. Talk about learners moving at their own pace. I'm going to emphasize that this does not mean acceleration in all cases. Um, and in many cases, what we're seeing is students are actually moving slower um, than what we would expect or, or um, than what we have maybe in a course-based model. Um, and that's really, really important as we talk about the, the options for CBE as we move forward. Um, most institutions will set up uh, equivalent credit um, for courses, so there is a mapping. Um, and then. Most of these programs are an all-you-can-learn model, so there's some kind of subscription-based um, options for learners. They can pull in more credits as they're moving forward. Um, they're not set with a particular schedule at the start of the term that 
they will will or will not accomplish by the end of the term. Okay, we're going to see if it works better if I use this mic. It does. If you will notice on the bottom of the screen, there is closed captioning happening as I speak. Mm -hmm. This is a standard feature in Google Slides now. Who knew? I didn't know until I got to a conference a couple weeks ago and someone from ASU was using it. So it's a great resource. Obviously, it's probably not as good as the transcription you would do after the fact, but it's a nice addition while we're there. Um, but it doesn't seem to be picking up these mics. <clears throat> so my, my point here is CVE is not equal to PLA, and PLA is not equal to CPL. What those acronym SOUP, which we are um, very guilty of in higher education, mean competency-based education or competency-based learning is not equal to prior learning assessment, is not equal to credit for prior learning. Competency-based education is, they are all interrelated, but competency-based education or competency-based learning are, the education side is providing the framework for the students the learning side is what the students actually do. But they come in with some sort of base knowledge, or maybe not, and still have the opportunity to build on what they know and can do already in competency-based education. Whereas in prior learning assessment, it is literally just what you already know and can do. It's not helping students gain new knowledge to build on from there. It's just looking at what you know and can do. PLA is not eligible for federal financial aid. CPL, credit for prior learning, is also not typically eligible for federal financial aid. But when we talk about credit for prior learning, um, at least what we talk about and what some of my colleagues in other institutions like APUS talk about is where you have evaluated some sort of certified training from the outside world and um, assign it credit value for your students. Um, someone who does a whole lot of this is the American Council on Education. Um, if your institution doesn't accept ACE credits, that's a easy win for your students to help move them to completion more quickly. Because it, it takes things that they have already done that are college level learning that has been certified by a third party entity and allows you to give them credit towards their degree for it. So I just wanted to underline this as we move forward because I think a lot of times people think that these three things are all the same and they're not. They're interrelated but they're very uh, separate buckets. Oh, that's also me, isn't it? <laughs> so um, one of the things we're going to talk about today is our programs, but as we uh, moved into building this presentation, uh, we thought it was very important to talk about the quality frameworks that are out there. Um, we'll talk in the next bit about some other frameworks that are already developed, but for competency-based education programs, um, the quality framework from CBEN is probably the most comprehensive framework that's out there to build your programs against. There are toolkits and a user's guide that can help you understand how you implement that on your campus. But I would say if you're considering doing a CBE program, just like if you're considering doing an online program, utilizing a quality framework that's already established will help you build in a more um, sustainable and a higher quality way. And these were all community developed. The CBIN um, framework for competency-based education was developed by those of us in the field who contributed uh, the things that we've done. And many of us, I use it as a uh, checkpoint, right? A continuous improvement checkpoint. After we were done building, now how do we keep making it better for our students? Okay. And so kind of how does this relate to other quality metrics, right? If you look at the general standards of quality matters, um, again, eight general standards, they relate to both the program and the course level, although QM focuses more in on the, the course level. Um, 
there's a lot of similarities across them, right? I think both in online and competency-based education, we're looking to increase quality while reducing um, student burden and friction, so making the best user experience that we can. I'll let Ginger talk about SUNY's. Yeah, I was just um, trying to relate the CBIN quality measure to something that you might be familiar with or that I'm sure you're familiar with, the uh, SUNY OLC quality measure and, and um, quality matters. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Western Governors University. It was founded in 1997, so it's pretty young. Um, it's a nonprofit university, and um, one thing that I love about Western Governors University is our mission. It was founded it, by 19 governors in the West, which is where our names came from, and they were trying to answer the question, you know, how can we ensure that more of our residents have greater access to a college education um, that fits their schedule? So they were trying to... Um, design educational opportunity that wasn't dependent on time or a certain, being in a certain place. The mission of WGU is to improve quality and expand access to post-secondary educational opportunities by providing a means for indi individuals to learn independent of time or place and to learn to earn a competency-based degrees and other credentials that are credible to both academic institutions and employers. WGU is regionally accredited by North, or the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities. And we have five colleges. We have a business college, an IT college, a health professions college, um, and general education college. Oh, did I say and teachers college? I don't know if I said that. Um, our enrollment, like I said a little bit ago, was, is about 120,000 students. Um, so since 1997, we've had 170,000 graduates, which is, I don't know, I, I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> Around 71% of our students are from underserved populations. Uh, most of them, almost all of them, have some college credit, but no degree coming to when they come to WGU. So we're we're our market, or you know, who we're looking to serve are the 37 million Americans that have some college credits but no degree. So, some key characteristics of WGU. First and foremost is, you know, the student is at the center of everything that we do, literally, you know, every conversation, um, all of our work that we do focuses on students. Um, something about our model, we have continuous enrollment. Students enroll in six-month terms at the first of every month. So, um, and they, undergraduate students, um, in their term, they'll have usually four courses. There are three CUs apiece, so you know, full time would be 12 CUs. Graduate students generally have three credits or three courses in their term for nine CUs. And once students pass the courses that are in their term, they can pull in additional courses. We call that accelerating. So they can, you know, really take or take as many courses in a term as they can, they can pass. So some students, you know, accelerate very, very quickly. But like James said, something that's important is, you know, and so competency-based learning is, you know, time isn't really a thing. It's not the focus. So, but so, so some students do take longer. For example, with algebra, you know, think about, you know, in a traditional 15-week course, some students may struggle with that. But if they had a little bit of extra time, you know, they may be, be able to be more successful. So, so some students do take longer. Uh, another key focus of WGU is a focus on assessment. We have different kinds of assessments. We have objective assessments, performance assessments, and then some courses actually have both. Uh, um, and students have to pass both. It's not an average of the, of the assessment. They have to pass all of the assessments. Um, for our objective assessments, we have online proctoring. Because we're competency-based, the security, reliability, validity of the assessments are very important. So we do use like ProctorU and Examinity for our online proctoring, or students can go to a testing center. Um, we have a technology that has a really great name, but I can't remember what it is, that's constantly crawling the web looking for our assessment items. Um, um, and, you know, if, if we find that one of our assessment items is on the web, it's immediately, you know, taken out of our assessments. Um, let's see. 
but we have a team of psychometricians who set cut scores for our assessments, our objective assessments based on beta testing, and also they establish the assessment forms and they continuously review the assessment data to look for um, a lot of different things that um, psychometricians do. Um, the assessment traverse for each course includes several different types of assessments. I thought that would be important to share. First, something that we're just starting to roll out as soon as we have a technology in place to do it are course planning assessments. And how that will work is at the beginning of each term, if a student has, let's say, four courses in their term, they will take the course planning assessment for each one of those assessments. Um, it's a short assessment, like 10 or 20 items, and they it's um, kind of like a diagnostic, so that they will kind of know where they are for each of those courses, and that will help their program mentor help them plan out their term. So if they have a little bit or maybe no background knowledge, it, for one, th that one might take longer. And if they have a lot of experience in you know, some other course, you know, they can anticipate that that one, the, the students could finish quicker, quicker, and that helps them schedule out their term and set goals. We also have uh, pre-assessments which are something that students generally take when they feel like they're ready to take the assessment for the course. When, they, and when students take the pre-assessment, they get a coaching report that shows them which competencies, which topics they're competent in, and which ones they're approaching competencies so that students know where to go back and do some more studying before they take the high stakes assessment. And then we also have two forms of the high stakes assessment. So if students don't pass the first time, they can reattempt. Um, so, uh, at WGU, students who have come, come with a lot of professional experience do sometimes advance through courses very quickly. Um, and like I said, also some students take longer for courses where they don't have any background experience. Um, oh, and our performance assessments, um, something that's different at WGU, they're all evaluated by our evaluation team who are not the same faculty who interact with the students teaching courses. So um, their the idea is for them to be very objectively scored, um, and the evaluators undergo training to try to you know, calibrate how they review assessments based on the rubrics. Um, another key thing about WGU is that our students don't pay out of pocket for learning resources per course. Uh, early on, it, um, WGU realized that that was a barrier for students they wouldn't accelerate courses into their term because they couldn't afford to pay for the learning resources. So at WGU, students pay for each term $145 for um, resources, and then WGU actually provides all of the digital resources for all of the courses so that the students don't really need to think about that. And then our faculty model is different. Um, and I don't know, I feel like in a lot of ways, this is kind of the most shocking thing about competency-based learning. So we have four pretty major roles. First, we have program mentors who are kind of like your student success team. They uh, we meet with students usually once a week, sometimes bi-weekly, once a student's more established, and they set goals with them. They, you know, look to see, you know, what progress they're making. If they have, they're starting a new course, they might um, give them advice about how to approach the course, like where to start. They make sure that they have the technology that they need to be successful in the course at the beginning of the course. Um, and they really are, a program mentor will stay ideally with the student from the day they, you know, they start until they graduate, so they really form a bond with the students. We also have a team of course instructors who are the subject matter experts who actually teach the course. Um, they provide one-to-one -one support for students. They provide one-to-many support for students. They do webinars. Um, they uh, create like, digital um, study guides, things for students. If a student doesn't pass a high-stakes assessment, their course instructor will give them a study plan that they need to like, complete everything on the study plan before they will be approved to retake the assessment. And oh, we also have the, the evaluators, which I spoke about who are also uh, content experts. And our evaluators are usually part-time, and they're really our only part-time uh, position that we have at WGU. And then we have program development, which is the department that I work in, and program development designs and develops 
all of the courses and assessments. So included on that team are instructional designers, assessment developers, we have an assessment specialist, we have program um, development owners that kind of oversee each program. And um, we also have a learning architect or a program architecture team, which is relatively new. And that team is working with MC and Burning Glass to um, kind of comb through job posting data to create skills maps, which we use then to design our programs and courses to make sure that students are graduating with the skills that they need for industry. And then next, just some lessons learned. And I feel like it's kind of fitting that Maria's here because <laughs> she actually was at WG before I was and has probably, I don't know, passed these lessons on to me as I came on board. So like one of the, the biggest ones um, is that initially the technology didn't exist probably still doesn't exist to support competency-based learning. So WGU has utilized hundreds of different platforms and technologies, usually using them not the way that they were intended to be used, um, to make our courses, programs, and student processes work. Um, and technology really honestly is limiting our design and our student experience because there are a lot of things that we'd like to do that we just cannot do because of the technology. So current state, WGU only enrolls full-time degree-seeking students. We don't offer part-time enrollment. We also don't um, offer, students are not able to take, you know, come for just a course or a bundle of courses because literally our technology doesn't allow for us to be able to do that right now. Um, but we are currently designing some micro-credentials and certificates so that we can, when we do have the technology in place, we'll be able to offer those. And we're also in the beginning stages of a multi-year project to design and build our next generation platform. Um, it's, we're calling it the multiverse. <laughs> and ideally this platform will support our students from enrollment all the way through graduation and beyond um, into the future. And then another lesson learned, uh, initially WGU was very focused on assessment because we're competency-based and really focused on assessment, but not so much the course in the beginning stages. So more recently, we're really focusing on using the universal design for learning principles and using, you know, like SUNY Oscar rubric to design high quality course experiences that offer students all of the resources that they need in the course on demand, you know, when they have time because our students are busy. Um, so we're really working on improving the quality of our courses. And um, we continue to update and improve our legacy courses, um, which is, you know, um, a challenge. So we have a lot, you know, we have our old courses, we have new courses, and um, we have a lot of work to do still. So those are our key lessons learned. All right, so Southern New Hampshire University, as I mentioned, has a number of different program offerings, uh, which makes us uh, distinct a little bit in terms of we really are kind of a micro um, uh, universe of, of the overall educational um, environment. Um, so College for America in particular is our competency-based offering. Um, and, and that was spun up um, as an innovation lab. It was uh, really brought into uh, conception by pulling off uh, a, a few dedicated folks that would really think about um, a way of designing a flexible, um, uh, workforce relevant um, uh, program. At the time that federal um, options were becoming available for uh, direct assessment financial aid. Um, so uh, SNHU was um, uh, the first institution that went through the approval process to acceptance uh, for direct assessment uh, federal financial aid. Um, and that still stands um, for um, how we have uh, 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 put this uh, program into place. We are on really the second iteration of our um, College for America programs. Um, so this started on a customized Salesforce environment that's gone through a number of different technology iterations um, and has now migrated and moved into uh, D2L's Brightspace. Um, that has presented a number of new technology offerings as well as challenges. Um, and uh, you'll hear as a consistent theme across all of our institutions, systems and technology regulations, right, th those are really difficult things to navigate when we're talking about transforming education and educational models, in particular around competency-based education. So that, that really has been um, one of our main challenges, is figuring out how to 
um, leverage the environment um, in a way that is going to be most successful for our learners. Um, partnering really closely um, with D2L right now in terms of um, working to influence their roadmap, uh, making sure that they have a good understanding of our key pain points, and then trying to transform that learning management environment um, the ways that we can uh, to support what is a model that is constantly challenging, um, uh, the ways in which we're thinking and designing. Um, so we are on a 16-week um, term structure for financial aid purposes, but that really does have an open and closing um, experience for students, um, as opposed to uh, this, this is a distinction um, in both our iterations internally of, of what we've done with CBE, because we were on a rolling enrollment every six months, um, and it moved into a more um, uh, consistent 16-week uh, um, term structure. Students can accelerate uh, within that, and they can pull in as many competencies as they, as they, as they want. Those competencies are delivered as individual one credit experiences. So if you're thinking about how we architect this in our Brightspace environment, these look and feel like one credit courses that students pull in um, through their registration. Um, and all of those experiences then have learning resources to support them. Um, they have interaction with a primary faculty member who serves as our lead faculty with um, a, uh, across a portfolio of competencies. That faculty member, similarly to WGU's uh, model, they'll host webinars, they will um, provide guided support, they will dive into the performance of each of the students within that competency um, and be able to offer guided um, interventions. Um, and then each of those competencies have a set of reviewers um, that are also part-time uh, subject matter experts um, that are calibrated for uh, the assessments uh, for, the, um, for the competency. Um, but within that competency environment, students then can interact with their faculty member. They can also interact with their reviewers. Um, they, they'll get feedback through discussion forums um, in both places, both private as well as kind of public channels as we talk about them. Um, so they'll have the ability to also interact and engage with their peers within those environments. Um, regarding um, the one credit, one credit, one competency alignment, this has been really important for our architecting of our curriculum in general. So we, we've really actually been moving the entire university to um, thinking about a common currency of our courses that are beyond courses, beyond three credit courses. So that really drives into us um, aligning around what is a competency that we think has credit bearing value that is, that is um, important enough um, that we can then pull that in and we can mix and reuse that competency across a variety of, of modalities. We can mix and reuse that competency across a number of different courses um, as students are moving forward. So there's a lot of different options for us, but that's been a new element that we've been working through for the university is really thinking about how you unbundle the courses and think about a different kind of currency that we can use. Um, so CBE is a great environment for us to experiment with that, but it actually is something that's translating to the rest of our um, university's offerings, which is, is really cool very complex for our design teams. <laughs> we, we talk about playing Tetris all the time now because it's just like you're trying to fit in very creatively um, some options. Um, it's an all-you-can-learn subscription model. Um, a couple of other um, important aspects around um, the faculty model. Um, it is really, really critical that we have uh, our faculty within this um, engaged on the learner experience. Um, we really focus on a, more, a, a collaborative model within that. Um, because all of our assessments are project-based assessments, um, we have uh, very much a focus on reliability and validity within that. Um, but there's a lot of interaction um, with, it, with the reviewer and the faculty member within that. Um, and that, that's a key distinction across a couple of models because we actually have fairly robust interactions that are happening um, with multiple faculty levels um, with a student um, that are fairly transparent and happening throughout the entire process. We can talk more about that if you're interested. Um, another aspect uh, for College for America that's really important to highlight is this is not a retail offering. Um, so it is not something that um, a student can go to the website and, and choose and enroll into. It is something that SNHU is exploring to uh, determine how we may actually then expand our offerings. But um, our offerings come through our channels, and this comes through workforce partners. Um, our partnerships team works on um, establishing key partnerships with variety of, of, of major uh, workforce um, uh, providers as well as small businesses. And then they can enroll their employees through um, their tuition reimbursement programs or tuition assistant programs um, into competency-based education. Um, we also have community education support partners. There's a variety of 
of community partners that are mainly focused on youth learners. Um, so those that are transitioning from K, um, uh, secondary education into higher education and actually supporting them through that experience. That also adds another layer because those community providers are providing an additional set of support um, structures. So they have on the ground mentors um, that partner with our teams and help students uh, move through the programs. And then uh, perhaps kind of most interesting is our global education movement. And this is the delivery of competency-based education to displaced populations, um, primarily in Africa, Middle East, um, and that's expanding. Um, so uh, we have uh, a pretty big uh, set of learners uh, in Rwanda and Kigali um, and expanding in Lebanon. Um, they are taking the exact same content. They are working through the exact same assessments. They are facilitated by subject matter experts across the board. It's a consistent experience for delivery. They have robust uh, resources and support within those sites. Um, but it is transformative. Uh, it, uh, we've got uh, almost 1,000 uh, learners um, moving through that. And you can see some of the statistics on that um, upper slide. Um, they are involved in uh, uh, virtual internships and job offerings. Um, and it's been an incredibly impactful um, opportunity for us to, to think about how competency-based education can be not only offered for, for the adult workforce learners, but also then um, really transform and be uh, uh, put in place in some of these um, most needed populations globally. Um, I put in a note there that we are really interested in, in starting to think about a hybrid online on-campus model. Um, we do have a model in place where we are delivering the online content, um, facilitated same, the same aspect of with our faculty models right now, online faculty, um, but there are on the ground campus mentors and students are living on campus, participating in campus activities, but taking all of their content through online, competency-based education. Um, so that's really, really interesting. We're learning a lot. Um, and some program details in there. Um, we are mainly focused in undergrad and um, these are mainly first to college learners. Um, the, the vast majority of learners in these programs are first to college because they cannot use transfer credit within these programs given the direct assessment restrictions on, on how we can offer uh, federal financial aid. Um, so that is interesting. They, they, it is a, a new set of learning challenges when you're talking about folks who have not had a college experience to date, um, which leads into some of the lessons learned. Um, we have had to focus very, very intensely on the learner experience. Um, thinking about how we can engage learners within the platform. Uh, we've done a number of usability studies across our platform um, because we've seen that the barriers to uh, success and completion often are things that we can manipulate in that environment. They are not things that um, are difficult. They're just things that are really embedded with regard to how our learners are interacting with the technology, how they're interpreting their requirements, how they're understanding what is um, uh, needed of them, but more importantly, how they're finding joy and, uh, and, and engagement in that platform. The, the more we can streamline those things for them, the more that they find that the process of learning is one that they can focus on. Um, some of the, the complications and, and the, the necessary um, uh, learning process within the assessments themselves, but not necessarily get caught up in academic language that's not getting them to the right uh, direction that they need to go. Um, as we craft out kind of what are your learning resources and things like that. Um, it's, had a, it's made us kind of take a step back and think a little bit more about usability as a first practice um, so that we can uh, facilitate those learners effectively. Um, a couple of other things that are on here um, and then I'll uh, move on. Um, again, I want to emphasize many students elect to go slower, um, particularly around key con concept areas that are um, difficult for them or they just need more time. Um, so, the idea of everyone kind of accelerating is, is not necessarily the case. We have dashboards to look at all of our student populations and understand what is kind of the ideal pace we want to keep people at, um, but that shifts and it fluctuates every single term that our, our learners are going through. Um, final thing uh, with regard to our implementation and lessons learned, um, it was really, really important for us to start with definitions and common understanding. Calling back um, the CBEN quality frameworks, that really provides a great roadmap for institutions, faculty, you know, uh, designers to be able to dive in and make sure that they understand um, from a common uh, language standpoint, what are we really talking about? What are we trying to achieve? Um, it also helps disrupt um, uh, people's uh, initial assumptions around how to establish a competence-based education model and what's restricted, what's allowed. Um, all of that really becomes noise. So you really want to start with a, a clean glossary and make sure that um, everyone involved has a consistent understanding of what you're trying to achieve. 
Good. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> at APUS, we offer a direct assessment competency-based learning opportunity for um, our students, and it creates them with a different journey than our traditional online. I know that feels weird to say. It feels weird for me to say because I came from a background at a land-grant institution, right? So online wasn't uh, traditional. It was the new thing, whereas at APUS, we were founded as an online university, and so, you know, direct assessment competency-based is a new, uh, new concept for us. Uh, we have four programs. I call them our bridge to the bachelors. They are um, courses all of our students have to come in with an earned associate degree. That was an agreement with our creditor and uh, the Department of Ed for our financial aid. That that had to be an earned associate degree. It couldn't be, you know, a conglomeration of transfer credits. So we have limited the um, students. We've limited our population on that based on needing that earned associate degree. Um, and these are the four areas that we had strengthened already. So if you're looking to think about competency-based education, I would say look to a place where you have strength and also where you have well-defined industry competencies. So all of our programs are mapped not only to the learning objectives of the traditional online program, but they're also mapped to the industry level competencies. So for that BA in retail management, all of the competencies are linked to the National Retail Federation's competencies, and then they are mapped to the learning objectives for each of the courses in our program. So it creates this um, kind of scaffold to make sure that all of it is preparing the student for what they need to do. Like SNHU, our programs are a one competency, one credit equivalency. Um, though we don't have to track the uh, clock hours like you do in a traditional online course or even in a, um, in a, in a course-based, competency-based program, we chose to do that for transferability. So each of our courses, if it's a three credit hour course on the traditional side, will have a three competency stack that can become that course if the student transfers into the traditional online, if they decide, you know, this CBE thing isn't quite for me because I'm maybe not so motivated to follow my own map and keep pace without having, um, even with regular check-ins, right, even with uh, regular support from their faculty and their mentor, um, some students find that they're just not, it's just not a good fit for them, right? So um, we wanted to make sure that those students had the ability to transfer out of the Momentum program as well. So we kept everything tacked together. So I have, because it was back before we knew about things like Corsoon, I have these massive spreadsheets that have each of the learning objectives mapped to each of the competencies mapped to each of the national competencies, and then you know the course descriptions that go with them so the students know what they're getting into. Um, so here's my team, right? It takes a team just like you have in racing to build and run a competency-based education program. You can't do this onesie, twosie, one course. That would be competency enhanced, and I that's a great first step, right? If you're thinking about competency-based education, look at national standards or national competencies that go with your discipline and map them to your courses and start expressing those to students. That is a very good way to do a competency enhanced and get your feet wet. But if you're gonna build a program, you're gonna need a car to drive it. You're gonna need a driver who's steering the the wheels to make the, the whole thing move forward. You're gonna need a support team of faculty and designers and technology staff and your administration are gonna be the people who are um, paying the bill, right? So they're the ones who are um, all of these little sponsors and sponsors on the car, right? Those are your industry partners who help provide you students. Now we are a retail offering, unlike College for America, um, any student can participate in Momentum. Um, right now, if you go and look at my website, you're not gonna find my programs. 
uh, we have intentionally limited because one of our lessons learned I'll talk about in a little bit is um, regarding federal financial aid and the definitions and maybe you'll see the tie through of why I'm so passionate about CBE <coughs> is not equal to PLA is not equal to CPL but that said we have intentionally limited our um, our enrollment while we work on building capacity to offer federal financial aid because none of the systems do that off the bat so you have to work around and create workarounds and create uh, new technology in order to do that so on our teams we have a student team and we have a um, institutional team on our student team they have what I call our trifecta of support they have for each competency they have a faculty what we call subject matter expert they are the person who teaches the course they are instructional staff who um, actually teach in both modalities we don't have dedicated faculty for our CBE programs right now so if you are teaching psych 431 there's a possibility you'll be teaching it in two different modalities um, it's two separate classrooms but it's you know two separate it's the same um, learning objectives and the same faculty disciplinary requirements for that um, so you have that person in the classroom with you the whole time you're engaging in the competency we have our faculty mentor and they are with the student the entire 16 week term we are also 16 week term subscription based as many competencies as you can complete in one term um, we ask students to try and focus on doing like one a week so they get 15 to 16 in a term but um, reality is they're more around 12 so is what we've shown that they are actually completing is around 12 um, but the faculty mentor is with them that entire term and often with them over multiple terms throughout their time with us um, and their guide their job is to be the metacognitive guide they're the ones who help you tie the threads of um, the threads of knowledge through the discipline right so how does this course relate to this course relate to that course and how does that relate to what I'm gonna do when I'm actually out of here right it's very Socratic they meet with them one hour a week um, synchronously um, it is one of the only programs that we have that has uh, that deep of a synchronous experience with our faculty but they are disciplinary faculty who teach in you know all of our across all of our programs and they help the students make those connections through the discipline um, let's see and then our third tripod of support are our um, academic advisors so at APUS we have professional academic advisors they're the ones who are going to help you with um, registering making sure your financial well on the traditional side making sure your financial aid is you know through and that if not getting you to our financial aid counselors but they're the ones who help you register they help you determine what your path needs to be in order to um, graduate in a timely manner and take most advantage of of what you um, what you have in front of you at in your program uh, so they are a professional staff um, what's important to note about this tripod is two of the three count towards regular and substantive interaction but that academic advisor does not creating your plan working on advising as far as any kind of technical advising or um, advising towards planning doesn't count for regular and substantive interaction and that is extremely important in especially direct assessment competency-based education if you're going to offer federal financial aid because you have to show that the students have regular meaning that it happens on a predictable schedule substantive meaning it's regarding the disciplinary topic interaction with that faculty member and it needs to be someone who is an approved faculty member at your institution someone who's able and qualified and credentialed to teach in that discipline so we achieve that by having those two roles right there's regular and substantive interaction in the instruction and there's regular and substantive interaction with your disciplinary faculty mentor so those are a few of our like nuts and bolts that's our that's our student team right and then on our other side we have the team that keeps the car running we have the people who put the wheels on right all of our programs were, were disaggregated or broken down from the traditional program 
we, where we can, we use the same materials in both programs. Um, our competency-based programs are, as I said, a degree completion. So they are only the disciplinary core. There is no general education. So yes, we do have 100 level courses in that BA in criminal justice, but it's disciplinary specific courses that you need to have the baseline before you move into the upper division courses. Whereas a lot of places you think um, you, you still have that mix of, uh, of general education at the upper division level, we've set it so that the focus is on getting discipline, which means you can come in with any earned associate. It can be an earned associate in general studies, it can be an earned associate in, um, it can be an earned associate in criminal justice, and then you build on that in working towards the bachelor's degree in it, but it doesn't have to be. It provides you the full base in the discipline. Um, so we disaggregated the content and the competencies from our traditional program. So we try to keep those matched as we go. We try to keep so that you have the same um, academic resources. At APUS, all of our students' resources at the undergraduate level are provided for them. They pay zero textbook cost, zero. We don't charge a fee, we don't, we just provide all of the materials for them. We've had a big push over the last two years to convert to OER to be able to keep our tuition low and not have to raise it. We did just raise it $20 this year, um, a credit hour. So, you know, we're, I think, 380 now instead of 360. So, still, still decently low um, tuition. But that is, and then on the competency-based side, it's a $2,500 flat fee. It includes all your materials for that 16 weeks. It includes all of your instruction, as many competencies as you can complete. So the faster you move, the less expensive your degree is. Um, I just lost how I was talking about this. Oh, so who's the team? So we've disaggregated. We've matched this with our content with our um, traditional programs. And so um, we use the same faculty. We use our full-time faculty to design all of the curriculum in partnership with our learning designers. Our e -learning, we call them e-learning architects, right? They work together to make sure that the content and the assessments are what they need to be. And all of our assessments are what I call authentic assessments. So it is a practical application of the um, competency itself. So in our emergency disaster management program, we have one on creating an emergency operations plan. Um, that's a key element of that discipline. And so our students then partner with a local municipality, a school, and create an emergency operations plan, and then write a scenario based on what uh, they would do to actually put that into practice were an emergency to occur. Um, a few lessons learned. <laughs> so this is my this is my 18 wheeler, um, and it's carrying a toy bobcat. You can't really see it, but it's carrying a toy cat, right? So. Um, but that goes along with right-sizing your technology solutions. Um, we started out using a uh, very complex adaptive learning platform in order to offer the uh, curricular support in our competency-based education program. What we found is that the complexity didn't add to the student experience. It actually, or the faculty experience, I gotta tell you that was a big consideration for us too, right? It was frustrating for the faculty. It was frustrating for the students because we, add, we were using something that was too robust for what we truly needed. Um, also, along with that, uh, the Department of Education did not see how the adaptive learning platform allowed for proper uh, interaction with the faculty and instruction from the faculty. They thought that the machine was teaching the students and therefore they also thought that our program because there was a diagnostic and the demonstrate mastery um, they thought it was PLA they deemed it PLA so 
we, that's why I try and educate people across the nation about what the difference is, right? CBE is offering additional instruction to what you already know, whereas PLA is just measuring what you already know. Um, one's eligible, one is not. Um, simplicity is paramount. We've pulled everything back into, um, right now, back into our primary learning management system, which is Sakai, but our institution just announced um, and actually on Monday has our first students starting in overall in Desire to Learn Brightspace. So I've just moved everything into one learning management system and now I'm going to move it into another one next year. Um, <laughs> but that's the, that's the pace of change, right, for online learning. Um, and then I would say persistence. If you're gonna embark on a competency-based education program, persistence is imperative. We would not have gotten through the federal financial aid process if we hadn't been persistent in asking the questions and revising and revisiting and sitting down and actually talking with the team at the Department of Ed in order to make sure that our program fit within the parameters. So that persistence in, um, in working with both our administration, persistence in working with our students, and persistence is imperative for your students as well, right? You've got to find ways to keep them intrigued and engaged and moving forward, or it won't be a good program fit for them. So especially in direct assessment where at least, I mean, James talks about his has student-to-student um, -student interaction. We don't, right? Our students don't have that. They have a, in the e-campus, sure, but not in the classroom. So, um, and that's maybe something that we might change in the future, learning from our peers. But uh, maintaining that persistence across the board is really important. I think I'm gonna end there, and we're gonna see if anyone has questions. And yes, my dog did come back from the Twitter feed. <laughs> she is always my questions dog. Okay, any questions for the panel? Did any come in online, Erin? Yeah. Do you have a question? I was just wondering for any of the three um, schools if you use any kind of management program such as Starfish in the background. You mean the student success management program, Starfish? Yeah. 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 We actually don't use that one. Um, when we transition to D2L, we're looking at using their suite of products, um, I, but I won't speak for you all. Um, this on? I'm not sure. All right. um, we actually just, um, I don't know, six months ago, started another homegrown technology. Actually, it's, it's part of Salesforce um, that we've crafted to do what we need to do. It's called a learner care dashboard that um, either program mentors or course instructors receive notifications when students either take critical actions or don't take critical actions. You know, if they don't engage in a certain amount of days, they'll get like a flag, or if a student you know, attempts a pre-assessment and passes, you know, the faculty member will send them an email saying, hey, great job. Um, so that's what we have, it's, learn it's called our Learner Care Dashboard. Yeah, similarly, we've got a, a number of, of different technologies. Um, so leveraging what we can from D2L, um, we're in a lot of transitions around our CRM um, for the university for our advising teams. Um, so that will move more and more into Salesforce. Um, and then we have an internal data analytics team that actually builds out a lot of the dashboards, the working dashboards that, that provide the flags, um, provide some automation behind the scenes for any kind of advisors or faculty to be able to understand who they need to reach out to, yeah. who's at risk, um, things like that. That's kind of what you're getting at. Yep. Maria. So um, I kind of have a question about small-scale CBE. Uh, you all work at institutions with large-scale CBE, and I have as well. And I see one of the key challenges in small-scale CBE being you have traditional faculty, you don't have access to build your own system. So, I mean, what do you think? Is this just a game for large-scale? I, I would say no. 
And I'd also say it's not just a game for online either. I mean, James talked about their foray into it a little bit of the hybrid, but if you look at the University of Maine Presque Isle, they have an amazing on-ground competency-based education program that's focused on traditional age learners. Um, but I think that you have to have, if you're going to, if you're going to do small-scale CBE, you still have to have good support from your administration and the people who actually run your technology so that, so that there's not a um, revolt. <laughs> I, I would just say an echo, I think, um, Kelly, in your slide, uh, right-sizing te technology solutions. I think there is a different question around scaling CBE for technology versus looking at really elegant solutions that are more low-tech, right? And I actually think we have, we've learned some of the same lessons, that, that working within um, Brightspace as a platform and the core technology within that actually offers up the vast majority of what we need. It's more a matter of when we start asking the questions about scaling and, and, and doing things in a more automated fashion and trying to find ways to support um, learners that, uh, we, that are not in the same time zone, that are not necessarily interacting um, on a regulated schedule, right? that, those, that's when we kind of get into a place of uh, we've got to figure out some new solutions. But the actual design model, you know, that, it's, a, it's a pretty, I would say, elegant, but low-tech um, uh, design model within the uh, learning platform itself. So, and I think that that's something, if, if we want to connect on that, we, we can really walk you through some of the ways in which we've prototyped a lot of different um, options uh, within models that, that I think can be suitable for kind of first foray in a CBE and smaller scale um, options. Any other questions from the group? appreciate you all kind of banding together and tackling this uh, topic from all your various perspectives. Really appreciate all the insights and oh, thank, you. thank yes. you so much. So, um, oh my God, are we done? Yes, we're done. <laughs> we're done. This is not the right one. Um, we are done and I am so appreciative of everyone who um, you know, was here and participated either virtually or, um, uh, or that was here in person uh, to all our speakers, to all of the staff and everyone um, who contributed and, and in, in all the different ways um, uh, uh, that, that folks have contributed to, the, uh, to this event. I want to um, thank you all so much and uh, for making this such a great event and a great community to be a part of. Um, I'm hoping to see all of you, as many of you as possible in Syracuse next year, um, virtually or in person. Um, it, it, we always manage to pull it off in February and, you know, I know that tons of snow are falling right now in, in uh, uh, over in Rochester, Syracuse area, but we've never lost a, a summit or a presenter or a participant yet, so I'm hoping to see you all in Syracuse next year. Please, um, if you have suggestions or ideas for presenters or ideas for helping us to improve this event, uh, I will be sending out a survey. Um, so if you would please uh, let us know your thoughts on how we can continue to improve this event. If you have ideas for additional speakers or approaches or, or whatever, please put those, whatever your thoughts are, into the survey. I'm trying to think if I forgot anything else. Yes? You can recycle them if you put them out there on the front desk. You're, you're welcome to recycle them. What have I forgotten? Um, I don't know. And if I did, just come find me on Twitter and, and we'll, uh, we'll figure out how to answer the problem and the question. Thank you very much. Anthony, thank you, thank Alan. you. Virtual folks, thank you. See you next year. Bye, everybody. Yes, sure.